Hey day students, today we will be having a look at an essay rubric and specifically how I use an essay rubric to mark um, to mark my students' essays. So uh, you should be able to see on the screen both the essay rubric and my face. Hello. I decided to be brave because I saw that, that like a, a video that has my face and gets more views. I'm so sexy. But anyway, so if you have a look here at Essay Rubric Explain, um, you can see that I have nicely broken it down, basically content, presentation, level seven to level one. So I am actually going to start with level one and then build my way up to level seven. Let me just move my little face here. There I go. Okay. So when you first we will have a look at presentation and then we'll have a look at content but please be aware that content is marked first so it doesn't matter if your essay is like perfectly oh beautifully structured you've got a fantastic introduction a beautiful conclusion lovely lovely um line of argument going there but your essay is nonsense so that, that you're still going to get naught for that essay even if you have beautiful presentation. So just keep that in mind as I go through the essay rubric. So over here, let's have a look at a level one for presentation. It says little or no attempt to structure the essay. Um, I have received a few of these from my own students where basically they did not study. They remember a splattering of information here and there. And what they end up doing is they just have one big paragraph of words. Whatever they could remember, they just throw that on the page and hope they get a mark for it. And the sad part is, is that sometimes there is a little bit of content there, but because they don't have an introduction, because they don't have a conclusion, they get put into a level one um, for presentation, which means that instead of getting a mark like, um, let's say about 15, they are now getting a mark of 10. Okay, so it can really make a difference in your mark just to have that introduction or that conclusion or whatever the case may be. Right, so that is a level one. You've written your essay in bullet points or just one big paragraph. You haven't made any attempt to structure your essay. Uh, then we have a level two, which is attempts to structure an answer. So they maybe have like one line of an introduction. Um, nonsense, but they've got it in paragraphs. Their nonsense is in paragraphs. Um, and you can see that they, they know a little bit about the things, but the things that they are explaining is very descriptive. So they're not, they're not actually answering the question. They are just speaking in a very... Uh, descriptive way. So think of it like telling a story. That is what we mean when we say descriptive. We're not proving the argument, we are telling a story. So for example, let's use the story of Goldilocks and then we'd ask the question, was Goldilocks in the wrong? Now a descriptive essay would say, um, Goldilocks went into the three bears house and she ate their porridge and she slept in their beds and then they found her and then she ran away. Do you see how that doesn't answer the question? The question was, um, was Goldilocks wrong here? So uh, an essay that actually is not descriptive would then try and answer that question. So instead of telling us what happened, it would say Goldilocks ate the bear's porridge and this was wrong of her. So you're referring back to that question, Goldilocks was wrong. Okay, um, and there's some attempt at developing a line of argument. So maybe here or there, you've got a few things that speaks to the question. No attempt to draw a conclusion. And this is so, so sad because sometimes a learner actually writes an okay essay because usually if you're in level two, your essay is not amazing. But they write like an okay essay. But if they had just put that conclusion in, they would move from a level two to a level three, conclusions not clearly supported by evidence. And that's a whole difference of like five marks just from your structure and from your presentation. So 
Remember, even if you're running out of time and you're not able to finish, always write an introduction, always write a conclusion, and remember your paragraphs because that presentation mark can bump you from one block to another. And you'll see what I mean when I go down to the blocks uh, a little bit later. Over here, you can see a level three. So a level three means you have an introduction, you have some attempt at a line of argument, and you have a weak conclusion. So it's like maybe just like a one line conclusion where you just say, therefore this happened. Um, and then there is some line of argument in your essay. Maybe you accidentally use the words Goldilocks was wrong somewhere in the essay. That is a line of argument. Um, but you can see that you tried. You tried to prove that Goldilocks was wrong, but you weren't 100% there. You have an introduction as well. So that shows evidence that you have actually thought about the question. You are really on the path to answering this question. Okay. If your conclusions are not clearly supported by evidence, that essentially means that your content is not enough to support whatever you are saying in your conclusion or vice versa. Your conclusion is not enough to support what you are saying in your content. So just be wary of that. Then we've got level four, which is plan and constructed an argument. Evidence is used to some extent to support the line of argument. Conclusions reach based on evidence. So this means you've got an introduction, you've got a body with paragraphs, you've got some line of argument, and you've got a fairly good conclusion. Your conclusion answers the question, speaks to whatever you've written in your essay, um, but it's not a brilliant conclusion. It's just a fairly straightforward one, okay? Um, your evidence is used to some extent to support the line of argument. So I always tell my learners to follow the P-E-E-L method because when you do that L, that link, you are always answering the question that shows a line of argument. So if you follow that method, point, explain, example, and then linking it back to the question, you've got your line of argument. So you cannot get lower than a level four because you've got evidence used to some extent to support the argument. But you need to also keep in mind that it depends on your content. You have to have enough content to put you in the bracket of a level four. Then you've got a level five. This is just a, a good essay, a plain old good essay. This child has studied really hard and this child has shown that they have well, they've really planned their essay. They've got a good introduction. They've got a good body with paragraphs and a line of argument, and they've got a good conclusion, but it's not brilliant. So it's a good essay, but it's not a brilliant essay. And that is essentially where most students fall when they write their essay, at least in my classes. Um, and then you've got a level six and a level seven. You'll notice that I only put one um, thing here for the level six and the level seven because it's so difficult to differentiate between a level six and a level seven. I find it very difficult um, when to put something in a level seven block, when to put something in level six block, and also when to put something in a level five block and when to put something in level four block. There's always like you feel like it's kind of somewhere in the middle. But anyway, so level six, uh, so level six and level seven both have an excellent introduction, a line of argument that is present throughout the essay, and an independent conclusion. So I'm going to explain what that means in a moment. So if you have a look at level six and level seven, you'll see it starts exactly the same. Very well planned and structured essay. So your essay, I can see you have really planned it really, really well. You've got a good introduction, an excellent introduction, in fact, an excellent body and an excellent conclusion. Now, here's where the difference comes. So in a level six, it says develop a relevant line of argument. You get that if you follow the P-E-E-L method. So after each paragraph, you've got that linking sentence that links you back to the question. Remember in my example about Goldilocks, one line at the end of each of your paragraphs that says, therefore, 
uh, this proves that Goldilocks was wrong in this situation. And then the next paragraph, therefore, this proves that Goldilocks was wrong in this situation throughout the entire essay. It's relevant, it answers the question. And it defends the argument of saying that Goldilocks was wrong. Um, and now here's where the difference comes between level six and level seven attempts to draw an independent conclusion. So what is an independent conclusion? I'm just speaking off the top of my head here, so don't expect brilliance. But basically, an independent conclusion is instead of just writing, therefore, Goldilocks was wrong. You say, therefore, Goldilocks was wrong. Because by eating the porridge, she's showing a disregard of the privacy of the bears. Uh, she's stealing from the blah, 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 blah. It shows analysis. It shows interpretation. Okay. Um, but an attempt to draw an independent conclusion is basically what I did there. Like, you can see that I was on my way there, but I kind of lost the plot halfway through. Of course, if I had written down an actual conclusion to this Goldilocks question, I'm sure I could have gotten like a really, really brilliant one. But because I'm just speaking off the top of my head, it becomes an attempt to draw an independent conclusion. So I can see that I'm using evidence from my argument in my conclusion, but it's not quite there yet. Okay, so over here, we have the level seven. This is where everybody is aiming. You always want to get your 50 yard book here. So in order to get there, you have to have good synthesis of information. That essentially means that your one paragraph has to link to your other paragraph, and each paragraph needs to answer the question. Um, you need to develop a original, well-balanced, and independent line of argument. So what tends to happen, um, because of the PEEL method, it's not a perfect method. Uh, it always puts the line of argument at the end of the paragraph. But it is also possible to build your line of argument into your essay. So every time you speak about something that Goldilocks did wrong, you tie it back to the question. So, for example, your first paragraph would speak about breaking into the house. Your second paragraph would speak about the porridge. Your third paragraph would speak about sleeping in the bed. And by each of those paragraphs, you step by step break down what is the cause what is the result, and how does this show that Goldilocks was wrong? Um, and that is actually developing an original line of argument. You're building your argument into your paragraph instead of just writing one sentence at the end of every paragraph. Um, and then there's also sustained and defended the argument throughout. So that means each and every paragraph is answering the question. Um, basically, I, I told you I struggle a bit with marking level seven and level six, but basically if I cannot find a fault in how you have uh, set up your essay, in how you have your introduction, how you have your body, how you have your conclusion, your line of argument, then I would put my kids at level seven. But if I find like one or two little faults, then I put them at level six, but I'm a very strict marker as well. Um, you can see that an independent conclusion is drawn from the evidence to support the line of argument. Now, I am not going to try and do an independent conclusion because I'm just going to embarrass myself uh, because thinking of an independent conclusion, just sitting here talking to a webcam, it's, 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 it's no good. It's no good. I need to actually sit down and, and write it out. But an independent conclusion is essentially a conclusion that uses evidence from your argument in the conclusion. Like you're really hammering at home, convincing the person that's reading your essay that this is the answer. There can be no other answer um, because you've thoroughly proven it. Okay, so that is how essays are marked in terms, or how I mark essays in terms of presentation. And now we can look at how I mark essays in terms of content. So I'm going to do the 7-7, seven, seven, and then you can see. What we do is we see where do these things intersect. So first we look at content, then we look at presentation, and then we see where does it intersect. So if you see here by level seven, you'll see question has been fully answered. You have not left a single thing out. 
then that question has been fully answered. If you've forgotten one or two things, it has not been fully answered. And therefore, you would go down to a level six, which means question has been answered. But because you forgot something, it's not fully answered. Now I see level seven, everything is there. You've got a good synthesis of information. You've got an original line of argument. You've got an independent conclusion. Then I put you in this block here. So you can get any mark between 47 to 50 if your essay is very near perfect or absolutely perfect. And there have been some very perfect essays that I've come across in my own class as well. Um, so if you go down here, you can see level six. Question has been answered. So this means um maybe out of you've got all your paragraphs but you've got the last paragraph where you speak about the short term and long term gains of something or you forgot about the political influences or the economical influences um, but you've spoken about everything else it's just one little thing that you forgot then you get a level six um and then i will have a look and i'll see okay your your essay has still been structured perfectly so i can still put you by level seven and then your highest mark you can get is 46. um so you can see that the difference between the seven seven and six seven is a difference of about um so it can go from 50 to 43 so that's a difference of seven marks just on how you mark that and then you can also see, you can also get a 7-6 where your question has been fully answered, but your presentation is not perfect. And then your highest mark would be a 46 to 43. So once again, that difference of seven marks just because of presentation. And that's why I say it's so important for your presentation because it can really bump you up. So if your content is a seven, it is a seven. I can't see that you've left everything out. Your content is a seven. But now I mark you down on presentation because you don't have a line of argument in every paragraph, for example. You can lose up to seven marks because of that. So you need to be very, very careful. Okay. Um, if you look at level five, question has been answered to a great extent. I'll explain that a little bit later as I go through this, um, this document. Okay. But a great extent basically means you've answered most of the stuff, but not everything. Um, and then you can see here is your biggest range of marks. You can literally lose up to 10 marks. So your content can be a level five, but then depending on your presentation, you can be anywhere from a 39 to a 28. So that's about 11, 10 marks difference. Ouch. Ouch, ouch, ouch. So you have the exact same content as somebody else, but because that person has a better presentation, they're getting a higher mark. So just be aware of that. So let's have a look at the lowest, the lower order, and then the middle order, and then the higher order. So I'm going to look, uh, I'm going to look this. firstly here. So 28 to 29. So you've answered the question to a great extent. You've got most of the facts that need to be there are there. And you show evidence of a planned argument. So you don't really have that line of argument going, but your content is there. Like your teacher drilled you, here, study this and this and this and this and this. And you studied it and you remembered it, but you didn't link it to the question. Then you're going to get a level five, level three, which means you show evidence of a planned argument. Because I can see you've got everything that needs to be there is there. You're just not relating it to the question. Um, so therefore, you'd be here by attempts to sustain a line of argument and then um, conclusions. OK, so conclusions not clearly supported by evidence might not um, be a thing if you have got a proper conclusion. So that would then bump you up to the next uh, bracket. But now let's look at the midpoint, which is 34 to 35. So this means, once again, you've got most of the information you need. Your essay has been well planned and structured. So I can see everything that you need, but your introduction, good introduction, good conclusion, and a good 
body with paragraphs with an attempt to develop a clear argument. So you've got your line of argument in almost every paragraph. You've forgotten maybe two or three or something like that, but you didn't tie it to the question. Um, question five, uh, paper two is, is very much guilty of this. So what tends to happen with question five, paper two is that my learners write um, they write about all the negotiations and all the violence, but then they don't tie it to the question. So like if the question was asking, um, how did they overcome the violence uh, through negotiation, then what the student would do is they would write um, about the Pretoria minute, but then they don't say, how does this overcome the violence? Um, and then obviously they'd have to tie it to the fact that the armed struggle was ended and uh, the MP lifted the state of emergency, uh, basically as a show of good faith. So they that would then need to tie back to the argument in order to show that you are developing a clear argument. If you just say the there was a Pretoria minute, you'd get the mark for saying Pretoria minute, but then you wouldn't get the mark for tying it back to the argument of the negotiations overcoming the violence. So, and then you'd be over here. Then, level five, level seven. So you have written an absolutely brilliant introduction, brilliant conclusion, brilliant body with original, independent line of argument, but you haven't covered everything. You've left a few things out. Then the highest mark you can get is a 39, okay? So, once again, question is mostly answered, but your, your presentation is brilliant. And then you can get a 39, which is almost an 80%, it's almost an A. So, if you know where you fall on this kind of rubric, you can try and push yourself up. So, if you're getting 28, 29, then that means you need to start focusing on fixing this presentation of yours, because then your mark can go up by up to 11 marks. If you see that your problem isn't really with presentation, but it's more with content, then that just means you need to study your content thoroughly and remember your content very well. Okay, so how is an essay marked? So I have explained this, but now we have it on the screen here. Content is king. What do I mean by that? A king is the most important person in a monarchy, right? So your content is the most important part of writing an essay. If you are not focusing on your content, you are in effect throwing marks away. Because you can have the most brilliant presentation. If the content isn't there, we cannot give it a good mark, okay? So an essay will be marked first according to content, and then the marker will look at presentation. This means that if you cover all the content, you can get a level seven for content. However, if your presentation is not perfect, you can get a maximum of 46 marks. So you've covered all the content, but your presentation isn't there. The highest mark you're gonna get is a 46 out of 50. Keep in mind, though, if you don't have much or any content, and when we speak about content, we're speaking about factual information, facts, not just any old thing you're pulling out of your head. You, I've seen an entire essay where a student just wrote nonsense, and that to me was just, ugh, I had to read it, and it was pages and pages of nonsense, my own kid, and I was like, did I even teach you? And then um, even if your presentation is perfect, your mark will be very, very low. So just be aware of that. Content is the most important. So even if you don't know your presentation, even if you write like one big block of content, like a whole page without any breaks, without any introduction, without any conclusion, we have to give you the mark for content because it's there, right? So you need to then adapt your, yourself and see where you can fix that so that you can get the mark for presentation as well. 
Okay, so what is the difference between a code 6 and a code 7? The question has been fully answered, means that you have not left out a single fact, and each fact has been properly explained with examples and analysis. Now, what is analysis? Analysis is looking at cause and effect. Because this happened, then that happened. Now, one of the things that uh, often happened with my students with the CRM essay that is now out of the curriculum, but basically um, they would tell me the protest, but they wouldn't give me the result of the protest. So they'd speak about the bus boycotts and they'd have a whole page on how Rosa Parks um, got on the bus and she refused to stand up for a white man and then she was arrested and it was a whole big thing. But then they don't tell me what was the result of that. The result of that was the year-long bus boy, uh, boycotts, which ended in the buses being desegregated. So that thing of showing how the arrest of Rosa Parks led to buses being desegregated, that is analysis. So you need to see that in an essay when you mark. Otherwise, it's not a code seven. You need to analyze this information. You can't just vomit it out on a page and not actually work with what you, you, you are throwing on this page here. Show me that you are actually breaking it down. What happened? What is the cause? What is the effect? Okay. Your content has to be tied to the question throughout the essay. That means if the question is asking you something, it needs to be, it needs to come out in your content. Remember my Goldilocks example? Every time you explain something, you need to refer back to the question. So in short, you are constantly proving your argument in each paragraph. Next, if you leave things out, but everything is mostly explained and you've got a simple line of argument to try to do an independent conclusion, then it will be a code six. Okay, so that is the difference between a code six and a code seven. What does to an extent mean? So sometimes something will be true, but it's not 100% true. Sometimes it will be 80% true. Sometimes it will be 50% true. Sometimes it will only be 10% true. Therefore, when we see something that it's, it's true, but it's not completely true, we say it's true to an extent. And there's basically three ways you can answer a question that's on extent. You can say, uh, you're basically asking the question, how true is this statement? And you can say, it's mostly true, therefore it is true to a great extent. If it's only halfway true, like there's some points for it and some point against it, then you'll say to some extent. And if there's very little truth in the statement, then you say it is to a lesser extent. Okay, now we look at the bottom tier. So now we're going down. I don't want my students to be here, so I don't really look at these things. I want them to be at level five and up. But anyway, let's have a look at level four. So the question is recognizable in the answer. That means I can tell that the student has studied, but they have not studied completely. So you can see little snippets of facts in each little paragraph that has been elaborated, but maybe not properly elaborated. Then it would be a level seven. And then it's a, a level four, sorry. And then it says there, some omissions. What does the word omissions mean? It means something has been left out. So instead of like with level five, where most of the things are there, when you get to a level four, you'd have maybe about half of the things there, right? So there's some omissions. And then you also have irrelevant content selection. What that means is, you use the wrong content to answer the question. So I actually had this happen in 2017 when I, I first started teaching the trick. I had one learner, bless her heart. She chose to do question, she chose to do question five when the essay that I prepared them on was question four. So at, at the time, I just marked her whole thing as irrelevant because she's not answering the question. I, I told you I was a very, very strict marker. So 
she tried to answer question five with question four content. And therefore, a lot of the content was actually irrelevant because it doesn't actually answer that question. Uh, so that, that's just basically what it means with irrelevant content. And then you can see the range is anywhere from 33 to 26. And you can see there's a very big uh, gap there. I'm not going to do the maths because I can't count. Okay. So now let's have a look at level three. Content selection does relate to the question, but does not answer it or does not always relate to the question. So I can see that the student has some information here. You got you you know that you need to mention Victoria minute. You know you need to mention Kuritiski a minute, but you mention it and you say nothing about it. So you'd say there was a Victoria minute, there was a Kuritiski a minute, um, there was a Kodesa one, there was a Kodesa two. So you know you need to mention these things, but you're not actually using this information to answer the question. They are omissions in coverage. So here you can see there's some omissions and here's just plain omissions. So you, you're not even answering half the stuff you need to answer. And therefore you'd be at a level three. And here's your range, anywhere from 27 to 23. Um, right, so level two, question inadequately addressed. So here's another part where I also get stuck because the differences between level two and level one are so, it's, it's really difficult to say whether something is a level two or a level one, um, because of both of it is question inadequately addressed. The kicker comes in by this word here, I'll show you now. I'm gonna just delete this stuff. In a level two, it's called sparse content, and in a level one, it's called inadequate content. Sparse content means you've got something there that I can maybe give you a mark for. Um, you've got enough of something there that I can find some marks for you. That would be sparse content. But inadequate content means you've literally got like one fact and there's nothing I can find in the rest of the essay to help you, okay? Uh, there's also that thing with irrelevant content. So like I told you before about the student that used question four information to answer a question five essay. That is completely irrelevant. Okay, and that is just how I mark. Some people are merciful, not me. <laughs> um, so you can see here, the lowest mark you can get is a level one, level one. And you'll see that there is a little star there. So usually at the bottom of a uh, rubric, there'll be like three little stars. And it basically tells you, because you can see zero to 13 is quite a big gap. But basically zero is if you have not said anything, nothing, there's, there's nothing. I can't give you a mark. You wrote your name at the top of the page. There's nothing I can do, right? So I always tell my students also, like, if you don't know, just write your nonsense. Write your nonsense. Give the marker something to find. Um, but if you don't write anything, we can't give you anything, okay? Um, then the next uh, kind of halfway package is one, two, three. That means um, that we can find something for you, but it's not enough. Um, and then the last one is, no, 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 no. It's, it's one to six, I think. That's that, one to six. And then the other one underneath is seven to 13. And that means it's just inadequate content. There's just not enough content to put you at a level two, but there is some content. Okay, and that is when you've got content, but you don't have an attempt to structure the essay. So there's no introduction, there's no body, there's no conclusion. Okay, so that will leave you with a 1-1, one, one, which is 0 to 13. Right, so what is the difference between some omissions and omissions? An easy way to think about it is that if, for example, there's 10 things that you need to discuss, 10 facts, 10 responses. 
And this is just really, really simplifying it a lot. Um, some omissions means that out of the 10 facts, you've covered about maybe six, right? It can mean that you've also covered all 10 facts, but you haven't explained it. So basically everything's a heading. And that is some omissions. Then you've got omissions, which means you've only covered about, out of the 10 facts, you've only covered about four or five. Um, or that you've mentioned, you've only mentioned all 10 facts instead of actually explaining them. So here the difference is properly explaining them, and this is you just don't explain them at all. Okay, and then here you see what is the difference between level one and level two. You'll notice that both level one and level two, it says question inadequately addressed. The difference comes in with sparse content versus inadequate or irrelevant content. Sparse content means that out of the 10 facts, you've only covered about two or three, or that the content which has been covered has not been properly explained. Basically, just headings instead of going into detail. See below for an example. So over here, I've basically just written, I had a look at an essay memo and I just copied the bullets and I pasted them here and I didn't explain anything. So I just took the bullet and wrote it like that. And therefore, my paragraph would look as follows, and this would be sparse content. The Congo inherited a single product economy from the colonizers. They wanted to Africanize the country by replacing foreigners with Congolese and nationalize the land. They wanted to diversify the economy in various ways. Mobutu became a dictator by overthrowing the previous leader in a coup. So here you can see that the facts are there, but I haven't actually gone into it. Like I say here, it's a single product economy. What were they exporting? What were they importing? I haven't actually explained that. Um, I say they want to Africanize the country, but I haven't said that this is called, uh, sorry, forgive me if I mispronounce it, uh, Zaire Nation or something like that. So I didn't like explain that this process of Africanizing the country was called Zyra Nation and this is what they do. Um, uh, they, they wanted to do this and this and this and this and da 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 da. Um, they wanted to nationalize the land. They wanted to diversify the economy. Okay, how were they going to do that? I haven't actually explained that. And then I say that Mbutu became a dictator, but I don't explain how did this happen? What were the steps to Mobutu becoming a dictator? So I've got the facts there. You can see it, but I haven't explained them properly. Now we look at inadequate content. This means you've literally only covered like one fact, maybe two facts um, with little or no elaboration. Irrelevant content means you have mentioned things which do not answer the question. So let's have a look at it below. The Congo had many political challenges because Mobutu was a dictator. So here you can see Mobutu became a dictator. Mobutu was a dictator. That's a point. That's a point. He killed a lot of people and then caused chaos in the country because he wasn't a good leader. So many people suffered and then the Congo did not succeed because of his bad leadership. You'll notice. He wasn't a good leader and his bad leadership, that is the same point. That is what we call repetition. He was called Joseph Mbutu, but he changed his name to Mbutu Sese Seko. How is this relevant to the question? He changed his name, but you're not really relating this. If you maybe said that he changed his name to become uh, more African, he didn't want to be associated with the colonizers, maybe you could say this is actually answering the question. But to just say that he changed his name is not enough. You need to relate that to the question. Um, he was in charge of the army and he attacked the people a lot of times. Once again, how does this answer the question? It's just throwing words on a page and not actually making an attempt to answer the question, whatever the question may be. He became king of the Congo. That is just factually incorrect because uh, he wasn't a king. He, I think he was president for life because he only made like one party and he could only vote for his party. So he was president for life, voted in. <laughs> anyway, 
So what do you notice? You notice that this, um, this thing is only one, two, three, four uh, sentences long, but it's got far more facts than this, which is much longer, but doesn't actually give me facts or factual information. So that's the difference, therefore, between sparse content and inadequate content. So even though the first box has less words than the second box, the first box has information that is factually relevant, while the second box is just being vague and descriptive with irrelevant and sometimes wrong content. So I hope that answered all of your questions on how an essay is marked. It's very important to know that how you are assessed. So when you actually construct your essays for this year, you will have a good idea of what you are attempting to do. So I'd like to thank everybody for their support on my channel. Like I've been ignoring my channel since last year and I saw it actually grew by like a whole 10 subscribers when I wasn't looking. And I was like, oh my word, when did that happen? So thank you very much for that and I'll see you next time. Okay, so this doesn't end, so I'll have to do this.